My lord, my ladies, um, before lunch, um, I was dealing with gen general principles of classification uh, law, which I say support the approach given by the upper tribunal to the meaning of chapter note three. One more general, I accept high level principle, but nonetheless support it. Um, can I take you to 107 of the core bundle to the paragraph we cite in our skeleton argument, please? 107. And it's paragraph um, 33 of the skeleton where we cite a principle which you will find recited in, in practically all, all the cases. Um, halfway through, just for your note, the case itself is at tab 26, page 349, but as I say, it's not a novel proposition, it's, it's, it's a standard one. And where the court says, in the interest of legal certainty and ease of verification, the decisive criterion is the objective characteristics as defined in the wording of the relevant CN heading, subheading, and the corresponding section of chapter notes. So two, two purposes served by having decisive attention paid to those things legal certainty and ease of verification. I say both those, admittedly at a high level, play an important supporting role in uh, identifying the dispositive character of chapter note uh, three, because uh, for the reasons identified in our submissions at paragraph 34, which I won't repeat, um, but we say that giving it that dispositive role evidently promotes legal certainty and ease of verification because where it's fulfilled, classification follows. Without more ado. Now, um, with those submissions in mind, I would just like to take the court back before we look at the two or three cases that I uh, wanted to look at and which we mentioned in our skeleton. Look back at the, the, the decision um, giving the appellant permission in this case by Lord Justice um, Nuji. Um, we, we agree um, with um, what uh, Lord Justice Nuji says in, in ground, in refusing permission on ground one except for two or three instances in which he uses the word classifiable in reference to note three, instead of the words are to be classified. So reading when he says next ground one, I don't consider that this ground has any real prospect. Note three requires one to ask of the goods whether they are parts and accessories, if so, whether they're suitable for use solely or principally with articles classifiable under chapter 95. If they are classified with those articles, I do not think this contemplates that the goods might be solely suitable for use with more than one type of article. Uh, he says, that does not, uh, the contrary view does not work as it does not tell you which articles the goods are classifiable. In other words, you need to know the article that the goods are solely or principally suitable for, solely or primarily suitable for, to know where they are classifiable. So those last two uses of the word classifiable, I would replace with to be classified. And if that language had been um, properly reflected in that paragraph, it is difficult to see how permission on ground three would have been granted in the first place. Because the remainder of the reasoning in that paragraph would fully support otherwise the approach of the <clears throat> tribunal. Now, um, I want to look at two or three examples of cases where the courts have dealt with note, chapter notes or section notes which contain a sole or principal use test with a direction to classify in accordance with it. And the first is Amina, uh, which you'll find at uh, tab 93, uh, so bundle three. Um, 
demeanor in the Supreme Court. It, yes, page 608. Yep. And um, here, the, cont the contest was between classification as a bra or classification as an orthopedic appliance on the basis that the bra was principally in, uh, uh, intended for use in accommodating um, a, a prosthesis for those who had had a mastectomy. Uh, now, there was no doubt that the garment itself had the features of a bra. Indeed, the first tier classified it as a bra. <clears throat> but there was a chapter note uh, which you will see that cited at paragraph 8 on page 683 which provided for classification as an orthopaedic appliance or a part and accessory of an orthopaedic appliance where chapter note 2b applied in paragraph 8 the supreme court the foot of 683 sets out that note other parts and accessories if suitable for use solely or principally with a particular kind of machine instrument or apparatus or with a number of machines are to be classified with the machines instruments or apparatus of that kind Uh, page 690, paragraph 29, the court, Supreme Court said, it is clear that the breast form is an artificial part of the body, but the bra itself is not. The issue, therefore, is whether, under note 2b, it is a part or accessory and suitable for use solely or principally with the breast form and so to be classified with it. And cutting long story short, the Supreme Court found that it was an accessory to an orthopaedic appliance and, and suitable for use solely or principally uh, with it in paragraph 44 on page 694, to which you've already been taken. And with that, uh, Amina won the appeal. There was no question of there being a contest between the bra heading and the orthopaedic appliance heading. And my learned friend says, well, fulfillment of note three doesn't rub out the text of other headings which are in play. That's a submission he made to you this morning. Well, it does. Because if it didn't, the Supreme Court in Amina would have had to go on to say, well, OK, now it fulfills the orthopaedic appliance principal use test, but it's also a bra. Two headings are in play. We need to now look at rule three, which is more specific, or if not rule three, which component gives it essential character, or if not rule three B, three C. There is no such discussion. The fulfillment of the principal use uh, as an orthopaedic appliance test directed the classification as per Lord Karmuth's judgment of paragraph 29. And the upper tribunal in Amina, for what it's worth, took the same approach. The upper tribunal, um, it's the upper tribunal's judgment which is effectively being upheld by the Supreme Court in Amina, the Court of Appeal having reversed the upper tribunal and upheld the first tier. So the upper tribunal is, is a, a, a reasonable place to look for, um, for, for a consistent um, approach. And it's paragraph 61 to 63 at page 920 of the authorities bundle. So tab 52, page I just invite you to read, well, perhaps note 61 to 63, but 62 is the kernel of the reason. We'll do that. I'm sorry, I'm slightly behind, so... I'm sorry, I'm on page, page no, it's nine, my fault, 920. 920, foot of the page. 61. 61. Um, 
And in fact, it's not up, 62 isn't marked, and I've just told you it's the kernel of the reason. Mm. So I'm sorry about that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so the, the point I derived. Sorry, just sorry. at least give me a moment. Sorry. But So, so even though I've taken time reading 63, that doesn't really take one any further. No, 62 is, um, is, is, is the key. Is it? Yes. So that is ultimately how the goods were classified by dint of fulfillment of that um, test. Um, the next case I want to look at is Proxen, uh, which you'll find at tab 15 of the authorities bundle, which is in This is a CJU judgment. Uh, if you look at 161, you will see that it was in connection with a number of tools. And hands operated screwing tools, spanners and wrenches, spanner and wrench bits and screwdriver bits. That's paragraph two. Um, the chapter note, which was in issue, is set out at paragraph 5 on page 162. And it's chapter note 2, and it says, parts of base metal, parts of base metal of the articles of this chapter are to be classified with the articles of which they are parts, except parts separately specified as such. So this is not about accessories, but about parts. But again, similar language, are to be classified with the articles of which they are parts. And uh, the relevant bit of the heading is set out at paragraph 6, and the relevant bit is spanner sockets. So if you just underline spanner sockets. The... Um, reply of the court is relevantly in the second question, and we've marked the passage at 171, paragraph 32. Sorry, paragraph? Uh, 32, foot of 171. Again, fulfillment of that test was uh, it's positive. And what was the rival heading? Uh, other tools, I think. Other tools. Yes. Uh, let me just set it out. It's uh, paragraph, I think it was 8207, interchangeable tools. Screwing, boring, drilling, threading, etc. Paragraph nine. And that was as a consequence of the application of the note. It was nothing to do with the specificity of one against the other. It was the note got you home. exactly homey. It's all about getting home. Exactly, got you there without more consideration. So what, once it's decided, you, I mean, I, I accept that this reasoning is relatively concise, but once you get that the court takes the reply to be disposed of by consideration of the note, the chapter note two question. So once that is determined in favour of that heading, no further consideration arises. There's no other um, uh, 
uh, discussion in that part of the reply. And um, fin final case, which we cited, um, certainly cited in the upper tribunal, GD European Land Systems, uh, tab 24. So same authorities bundle, tab 24, 322. Three, two, two. Taking it from the um, head note, um, you'll see that um, the goods in question were a turret system for armoured fighting vehicles. Customs office accepted that those goods for free circulation and informed the applicant of the rate, etc. The customs office concluded that the goods concerned were an armoured turret, which as an identifiable part will be fitted solely or principally in armoured fighting vehicles. The applicant challenged that on the grounds that they could be uh, classified as 9305 military weapons. So it's an armoured turret. There's a heading which uh, applies to armoured vehicles, which includes things used principally with armoured vehicles, and there's also a heading for weapons, armaments. So that was the uh, contest. You'll see um, 325. This is the same uh, section notice Mr Sykes referred to earlier, section 17. So it's not a chapter note, it's a section note, but a paragraph 6 Section note three, references in chapters 86 to 88 to parts do not apply to parts and accessories which are not suitable or for use solely or principally with the articles of those chapters. A part or accessory which answers to a description in two or more is to be classified under that heading which corresponds to the principal use of that part or accessory. So slightly different language I accept, but I suggest it's driving at the same thing, namely that identification of sole or principal use is the driver for classification. Uh, and we can see how that is resolved. These are chapter notes, are they? Section notes. Section. This is a section. section. But, it, but, they, but they're the same, they're equivalent in legal terms, they're both legally binding. It's just that the section notes cover a series of chapters. So they are sort of one up in the hierarchy. How was that note interpreted by um, the court? Uh, page 329, paragraph 32. Can I invite you to read 32 and 37 and 38? The same approach um, is followed. Fulfillment of the solo principle test equals that, that solves the classification. Only if that is not fulfilled does the referring court then have to go on and assess whether the other heading is in play or not. Um, 
as I have indicated, I accept that the formulation is slightly different there, but there is uh, a, an obvious reason why it is different. Um, if I can ask you to look at the authorities bundle, same tab, tab 4 for section 17. Sorry, so we're in uh, authorities. Same authorities bundle, bundle one tab, tab four. Yes, section seventeen is the, is page thirty six. Thank you. And section note three, that's the note that the court is referring to in that case, middle of the page. References in chapters eighty six to eighty eight to parts and accessories do not apply to etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's because, in contrast to ninety five oh three. The headings of chapter 86 to 88 do contain lots of references to parts and accessories, whereas you've seen that chapter 9503, none of the headings contain a reference to parts and accessories. So it would have been a very silly thing to do to formulate the chapter note by saying references to parts and accessories in the chapter, because, because there aren't any, or there aren't many. But by contrast, uh, Chapters 86 to 88 contain lots of references. So, for example, paragraph page 38, uh, page 38, middle of the page, 8607, parts of railway or tramway, and then even more significantly, perhaps page 44, 8708, parts and accessories of motor vehicles of headings 8701 to 8705. So, the, I, those aren't the only examples. There are lots and lots of references to parts and accessories, which makes that formulation of the sole principal use test sensible in that context. If a similar formulation had been used in Chapter 95, as I say, it wouldn't have bitten on anything much because there aren't many references to parts and accessories in Chapter 95. Now, um, Mr. Sykes says, well, those, those aren't cases that are to do with GIR 6, and I accept that. But they are cases to do with the meaning to be given to a sole principle use chapter note. And if he's right that that shouldn't be given a dispositive meaning, it doesn't rub out the other text, then all of those cases would have go gone on to consider the competing headings and resolved any dispute by reference to Rule 3, not Rule 6, because it would have been a heading dispute, I accept. So they do, I suggest, undermine, uh, fatally undermine um, the submission made. But it is also striking that the appellant doesn't cite a single case of the court treating fulfillment of a principal use test, but not classifying the goods accordingly. And we say in our skeleton, and I stand by it, there is not a single case of which I am aware where despite the fact that the goods have fulfilled a sole principal use test with respect to a particular primary product, they have nonetheless been classified elsewhere with goods with which they do not enjoy that relationship. And for what it's worth, we say the cases that we've cited show the opposite uh, is the case. And there's no point citing endless examples of it. It's, it's really a question for the appellant to show you that this, uh, that this approach is countenanced by the court and, and is supported in the case law rather than, rather than the opposite. So can I next turn to the way in which the um, case is um, put? Uh, and here, can I um, invite you to look at paragraph 50 of the appellant's permission skills? In the core bundle, isn't it? it is in the core bundle at page 35. Tab 1, page 35. Uh, 
I say that the answer to paragraph 50, which is these three paragraphs contain the submissions that um, Build a Bear deployed and on which they were given permission to proceed. And essentially, the, the core of it is paragraph 50. And I say the answer to that paragraph is that GIR 3 is not needed because chapter note 3 resolves the issue without recourse to GIR 3. And I go further. Okay, should we just read that? Of course. You would just say, actually, um, the statement, there's no reason why note, the Note 3 heading should take priority, is just wrong and yes. is contrary to all those cases exactly. you've shown us. Exactly. That's it in a nutshell. Yes. And the appellant's approach has always been based on the proposition that the subheadings for dolls and accessories of dolls and toys representing animals are both in play because the objects or the goods were not suitable for use principally with only animals. And that you could have goods which were suitably, principally suitable for use with both dolls and animal toys. That's always been the fundamental proposition at the heart of their case. Now that avenue is no longer open to them, they have to find some other basis for, for showing why the doll subheading is in play. But on analysis, this paragraph shows that the submission continues to be based on the grounds for which permission has been refused. So if the first sentence, there is no conflict between note three and reference to parts and accessories for the reasons set out above. In other words, for the reasons set out in support of grounds for which permission has been refused. Second sentence, even if that were not the case, the wording of the doll's heading is clear and cannot be ignored. There is no basis for Note 3 to override it, if it is accepted that Note 3 can itself be satisfied by more than one item within Chapter 95, such that it can be necessary to have regard to GIR 3, then etc. Um, that is also predicated on those um, prior submissions. So what we are left with, I suggest, is a general submission that the very fact that the doll subheading mentions accessories means that these accessories must go there. Um, but that, I suggest, is on analysis no more than an assertion. And as, I've, as I said in my summary at the beginning, it's not a question of ignoring the words, parts, and accessories of dolls or overriding it. Because on neither HMRC's approach nor the upper tribunal's approach are those terms given no meaning at all or no scope. And I've set out my submissions on I that. I mean, you are in a sense overriding it, but you're not leaving it without a role. It, exactly. Overriding it on the basis that it's, it's to be overridden by virtue of the terms of note three. Yes, I, I would accept that. You're not, you say this, you're not rubbing out those words. No. You're confining them to what you you're, say is their proper meaning, and yes. you're not. You yeah. don't get that. I, yeah, right. I would accept that way of putting it. So that is also the answer to the submissions at paragraph 21 of the appeal skeleton at page 70. where a similar submission is advanced. 
And I make one further comment in relation to 21C. But at page 71, this makes sense. Since there is no reason why an additional feature should prevent an accessory from being classified as such. Well, that's the wrong question. The question isn't whether the slits prevent classification as an accessory. The question is whether the objective characteristics of the goods show that they're principally suitable for use with animal toys. If they are, that's why they're not dolls' accessories. So here, and in quite a lot of submissions that you've heard this morning, the appellant is harking back to the submissions that made to the first tier to try to suggest why these weren't principally suitable for animals in the first place. They said, well, look, the slits are small, they're discreet, they're just a, in a dropped stitch, they're just a, a gap in the seam, the loops can't be seen from the outside, they don't detract from use, they don't hinder. All those submissions were deployed in support of the proposition you, the first tier tribunal, should not find these to be principally suitable for bears because they are insignificant on, for those reasons. And the first tier rejected that. Um, so they can't now be introduced, um, as it were, under cover of this submission when the finding is that they are principally suitable for use with bears. I'm not sure Mr Sykes was relying on those points for that purpose. He, he was relying on them to Going to get this wrong, but broadly to suggest that there was no sense in uh, treating the two categories in the way that you propose. Yeah. Well, and, and I suppose also to, 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 to support his overall submission that they can be used with dogs, there's nothing to prevent them. And insofar yes. as yes. he says that, yes. that's never been in dispute. They can be used with dogs. Um, so then um, the next section is are, are they accessories of dolls and in this section I, I I've assumed in, in what I've said so far that they are capable of being accessories of dolls but that that classification is overridden to use your lordship's phrase by chapter note 3 so even assuming that they are accessories of dolls Bilderbear loses that point but the next point I want to make is that there are no findings by the tribunals, either of them, that they are dolls' accessories, specifically dolls' accessories. Neither tribunal found that they were, and neither tribunal found that the goods were prima facie classifiable as dolls' accessories for, for Rule 3 purposes. Um, now, Mr. Sykes says, sorry, Mr. Sykes says they are because um, they can be used with. Yes, yes. and also they relate to rather uh, than the kennel. Yes, um, but but um, he he asserts that um, he asserts that they're dolls' accessories at paragraphs forty eight and forty nine on page thirty five of the bundle. But I just want to take you to what the, tri the closest that the tribunals got to addressing this question. Um, we deal with this at 67 to 68 of our skeleton. I won't take you to those paragraphs, so I'll take you to the actual decisions. But 68 to 67 of our skeleton responds to that. So the first tier, 177. It's the final part of paragraph 177 on page 199. Second half of the paragraph. First half of the paragraph is dealing with the overall construction of the, the headings by reference to note 3. But then... The tribunal says this, I also think it likely that in any event the terms, parts and accessories thereof in the doll's heading is to be interpreted as meaning that an item must be mainly or principally intended for or suitable for use with human dolls for it to be an accessory of such a doll. And I say that that is not only the finding of the tribunal, but it is right. 
as a finding, the upper tribunal, for its part, certainly doesn't reverse that. Just, just pausing there before you go to the upper tribunal, you say that as a matter of law, for an item to be an accessory, it has to be mainly or principally intended for or suitable for use with human dolls. For it to be an accessory of, of a doll. doll. Yes, I do. And that's regardless of Note 3. Yes, I say that regardless of Note 3 because that word thereof connotes the use to which the part and accessory is to be put. And I'll take you to Honeywell Analytics, the case that um, you were taking to this morning, to demonstrate that there is a general principle that where a heading contains a use-based criterion, sole or main use has to be demonstrated. And that is what the first year tribunal is getting at there, saying, well, are these dolls accessories? Well, are they accessories of a doll? I think, the tribunal is saying, it must be mainly or principally intended for or suitable for use with human dolls for it to be an accessory. And I say that that approach is supported in the case law. Um, but before we visit the case law, let's just look at the upper tribunal. The Upper Tribunal, page 251, 251, paragraph 120. They just say, for the reasons given below, we do not, for the purposes of the appeal against the FTT, need to determine whether the intended use of clothing or wigs with its dolls in human form is sufficient to be taken into account for the purposes of classification. And Do they say, not and say things elsewhere which are inconsistent with that approach? I mean, they're envisaging the, the dual use items being within the doll's subheading. They, they, they are uh, in, well, let's just see what they say about yeah, it sorry. in 124. Um, in 124, they put it as a possibility. So you can see in line three, even if we accept the possibility that the clothing and wigs might also fall within the parts and accessories of dolls of heading on the basis of a main intended use, emphasis on a, this is not a case which requires recourse to rule 3a because it's not finely balanced, etc., etc. Now, that approach of using or classifying them as dolls accessories is predicated in, in and of itself on identifying a main use being with clothing and wigs, notwithstanding a principal use for something else. Um, now, that is not a fair reading of the authorities, and it actually derives entirely from a tentative remark in Lord Justice Davis's judgment in Honeywell. So to be clear, you say the A is wrong. Yes, it's the. It's the main use. And, and the case and law just supports that. To try to keep myself um, clear, is that inconsistent with the conclusion on Hartz? It probably is, yes. to be frank. It probably is, and we didn't cross appeal that. Um, but it, but it is, yeah. I accept that. It would just help me to see the full picture if, at some point, you could give me a couple of sentences on where you think Hearts should properly have ended up and how it should properly have been dealt with. Yes. We may not be deciding that, but I would just have assisted to know. Yeah. Um, yes, I will look behind you for someone to prompt me on that because um, <laughs> Your learned junior it's a sort of yes. cognitive yes. overload um, for, for present yeah, purposes. Yeah. But yes, I will try and do that. Um, so can we look at Honeywell um, on, on this point because it's, it's a good summary of where everything is. Um, tab 41 of the authorities bundle, um, bundle 3. Um, 
this was a case about whether a device was uh, for measuring gas or for alerting. Um, and it measured gas, but at a certain level gave off an alert. So, bo so both, but of course, in this world, there's only one right answer. And so the first tier decided, well, it's not for measuring gas. It measures gas, but that's not what it's for. You don't send someone into a tunnel to measure the gas. You send them, you, you, you want to know whether the, 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 it's a beyond a certain threshold and you want to know that the alarm is sounded and so on. And essentially that approach was upheld by the majority of the Court of Appeal on the footing that that word for connoted a use-based test. Uh, can I invite you to look at um, Law Justice Sales' judgment at 129, page 745. And 136, please, uh, on the next page. Uh, you just maybe read from the, um, the last four lines by combination. Justice Davis agreed with um, or Justice Sales, and that I suggest is the correct readout from the course of court's case law. Uh, you'll see there that a number of cases are cited. Sony, which was regard to the console for playing video games, is it exclusively or mainly for playing video games? The other two cases are about nightwear. Neckerman and Vina are both ancient cases about nightwear, where the court adopted an identical test, namely, are there features which indicate that the garment is to be solely or mainly worn in bed? That's what they were all about. So that approach is well embedded in the court's case law, going right back to um, references in 1993, Neckerman being the first right up to date in the more technologically advanced Sony context. Um, where does this reference A come from? Well, it comes from one paragraph of Lord Justice Davis's judgment on page oh, 741. Sorry, pause, para 136. So you say that the, the sales approach in para 136 is well embedded in the case law. Correct. And that sales approach is the binary choice point, is it? That it's, it's one or t'other? Uh, what, what, what is yes, that? no, that reference to binary choice is a, is a reference to the fact that there were just two headings in dispute okay. in that case, so, so I wouldn't want to get carried away with that. The, the, what is correct is the identification that some, in order to be for something, you have to show that that is the main or principal use. So it's the last line of 136, the main or principal use. Because that was the language of that subheading, was for. Yes, for, and we have thereof in dolls, which is, again, a slightly different word, but I say imports a test of use with a doll, and therefore the court's case law on what counts as use for a particular purpose applies, and that that's what the first tier tribunal had in mind. But I want to address this question whether a main, a main use might be enough, and that comes, the only source of that comes from Lord Justice Davis's 
judgment in the same case, page 741, at 112. And my Lord, Lord Newey already pointed out when Mr. Sykes was referring to this that the actual citation from Sismax that Lord Justice Davis quotes in that paragraph doesn't say a main use, it says the main use for which the product is intended. You see that in the last line of the uh, quotation just above the continuation which begins accordingly. And so I, I, I suggest that the clear statement in the case law is the main use and that... And Sismax is another four cases. It is. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's another four case. Um, Neckerman and, and um, Neckerman and Wiener are not four cases. They are cases which were just about nightwear. And the court said, well, that, that, that means that they must be suitable for wearing in bed, and it's a use-based test. So whenever you've got a use-based test, that's the approach you take. So it's not predicated on the appearance of the word for in the heading, albeit that that was the context in Honeywell. So these cases are drawn from a number of different areas of the tariff um, with a number of different headings. Um, as I say, in, in, in Neckerman and Wiener, they were just about daywear and nightwear. Um, night, night dresses, I think, if my memory serves correctly, was the tariff term. Um, so I, I suggest that that tentative bracketed phrase, or possibly a main intended use, um, goes too far on the basis of the decided case law and that a main use is uh, n not enough. So, uh, Can I just pause a second? Yes. So in Honeywell, yeah. the question was whether it was in 9026, instruments and apparatus for measuring or checking. Yes. I'm on page 722. Um, yes. And the consequence of what you're saying is Lord Justice Sayles gets it right when he says to fulfil that, it's got to be the principle, the, the use of this thing has yes. to be for yes. checking the gas level. Yes. And so where Lord Justice Davies in 112 suggests in brackets it might be a main intended use, yes. he goes too far. That's the bit that's wrong. But Correct. I just wanted to Correct. catch up. Okay. Correct. Have I, have I that, got it that right is, that's a correct summary. Neither of them found that it was for that, incidentally. Um, because they, they both found that it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a measurement that, that wasn't at all. the purpose was, of the device. Yeah. And, and while we're pausing and taking out of your course, <laughs> yeah. if you're right about this, um, the reference in the dolls subheading to parts and accessories is entirely unnecessary. It, it, it's unnecessary, but uh, it shows where parts and accessories of those items go. But then. Why haven't you put they put the same in for uh, the toys subheading? That that is not something that we we have tried to find an explanation for for, for that, but there, there isn't. And looking at the terms of the tariff, the tariff has never had a part and accessory separate heading for any of the other bits of ninety five hundred three apart from dogs. Um, now we cited an old case um, called Import Gadgets wh where. Dolls was in its own separate heading at one stage back in the 70s. And um, there was a split between dolls and parts and accessories thereof. And at some stage, all of those separate headings were merged into what you now find as 9503, containing dolls and wheeled carriages and etc. etc. So a process of legislative change has resulted in the tariff we have today. Um, so, so, so one possible answer is well, that's just how it is. It's yes. a matter of history. Uh, but the way you're putting the case now is somewhat less attractive in one respect than the way you were putting it before. Because yes. the way you were putting it before, dolls, uh, parts and accessories had a role to play, whereas it doesn't really. Yes, I accept this strays into more the respondent's notice territory, where we say that dolls and parts and accessories thereof only means parts and accessories which are solely or principally used with dolls. Uh, we say that that 
result flows for the reasons identified in the respondent's notice, but I also say it flows from this case law. And the point against me there is, well, therefore, you're saying that that, that formulation is, is, is otios. It, it doesn't add anything. And I accept that that would be unattractive in certain contexts in a domestic law statute, say, where you might say a redundant construction type point would be powerful. I only accept that that would be the case in some domestic contexts, by the way. There are plenty of cases where redundant construction arguments are dismissed all the time. But in the context of a tariff, which has got literally thousands and thousands of entries for things which can be traded on the international market, I say that sort of interpretive principle you might find in Benyon, you don't find in the general rules of interpretation. So in other words, I say you should approach this goods tariff with a limited set of legal principles to be applied. And th that limited set is in the interpretive rules. And they don't contain anything like that sort of um, rich interpretive canons of construction that you might have in the context of, of domestic statute with and taking us for of course a moment yeah. longer, said the heart type case, it doesn't come in within 9503 at all. At all. And that's what we said, and that's what the first tier found. So I think the answer to my Lady Lady Justice Whipple's question is we said the hearts don't come within 9503 at all, because they're not identifiable as being used either for dolls or bears. They therefore don't have that sort of close relationship with Articles of 9503, which the Chapter Note 3 test posits. Therefore, like anything else that doesn't have that very tight relationship with those goods, they're just classified in accordance with their composite, their, their composition, plastic or textile or whatever it might be. Even though they plainly do have that relationship with the top heading. Even though they have the relationship with, with goods of that heading in general. So that hinges on putting quite a lot on the word thereof. It does. Okay. And that puts you at odds with Mr. Sykes's submission that um, you just look at you just take a sort of canter at note three when you're looking at the heading level and you just say as long as it's roughly speaking looking yes. at, it could be looking at more than one item yes. in the heading. Yes. You say the things the, the things I have in my hand. Yeah are clearly parts and accessories yes. of the, the sorts of things that are in yes. those headings, and that's good enough. And you say, no, 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 you go back to GIR 1, do you, and the note. Yes, I say you go back and you ask of each of the things in 9503, wheel toys, dolls, dolls' carriages, puzzles, other toys, you ask of each of those things, is this thing suitable for you solely or principally with that thing? Yes or no? No, move on to the next one. No, move on to the next one. When you get to dolls, the answer is no. Then when you get to other toys, the answer is yes, because you found that they are suitable principally for all. I, I, I follow that, and I follow the logic. It's still a bit unattractive. I mean, if you had a note three in relation to a top heading, which has just two items in it, A and B, yes, and something that was an accessory exclusively to A and B, and not to anything else in the whole world, um, you say, well, it still doesn't fall within um, the uh, category at all. Well, that would depend on what the grounds for inclusion as an accessory of those things were. If if the grounds for inclusion were sole or principal use, it I'm would assuming fall out, that yes, it would fall out. I'm assuming it's the same note three. Yes. Um, it would, it so would so fall even outside. though if it had were principally A or principally B, it would be within the the, the um, correct. Uh, heading because it's both it falls outside entirely even yes. though it's not an accessory to anything else at all yes but that but that result follows for all accessories which don't have a solo principle use with articles of that chapter so there will be lots and lots of things which are not solely or principally used with articles of that chapter and can have a more general use I, I suggest that the sole or principal use test is quite a tight test. You have to show that it's exclusively used for something of that chapter, or if not exclusively, then principally, first and foremost. 
So items of general use, which can be used for any number of purposes, fall outside automatically, even if they are and can be identified as being perfectly capable of being used with articles of that chapter. And even though they can't sensibly be used with anything else but items in that chapter. Well, I find that quite a difficult. That would be a theoretical. That would be a theoretical scenario. I find it difficult to see in real life what would fall within that as an example of something. I don't know. You, but suppose that um, you produce. You have dolls. You have stuffed toys. You produce an item that is. Equally appropriate to both. Yeah. Um, but not appropriate for anything else at all. Yeah, I mean, because it's an adjunct of a toy. Yeah. Well, that's hearts, isn't it? That's exactly well, hearts. hearts, yes. So, what are hearts well, used for? Or, or a scarf, scarf possibly. Yes, a doll's scarf, yeah. a bear's scarf. Well, we, we say, so this, this is a respondent's notice pair of tree, first of all. So, this arises if the upper tribunal. So, thus far, I've been defending the upper tribunal's which is that those things fall within 9503 for the reasons that your yes. worships have just been canvassing with me. Um, I say a more logical and straightforward approach to note three is to ask the question in relation to each and every object of the individual heading, because the purpose of doing that is to ensure that the goods, the accessories, travel with the principal goods to their classification destination, if you like. So note three, the operation of note three is predicated on there being some other article which you know is classified in chapter 9503. And you have to know what it is to know where it's classified. So that suggests that accessories get into 9503 because they have re that relationship with identified goods of that heading, not because they have that relationship with any number of goods of that heading. Because to say that they have that relationship with any number of goods within the top heading doesn't tell you anything about where they're classified. You have to then go through the, 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 the same exercise, but at the lower level, where you've got a contest between dolls and stuffed toys. And the upper tribunal did do that, and still came out in favour of, um, still came out in favour of stuffed toys because of the directive nature of Note Three, and, and that, that I support that as my first principle. But uh, HMRC's approach and the first tier tribunal's approach, we say, is a clearer and more obvious readout of Note Three. But it does have the outcome that, that articles of textile, like a scarf, which don't have any characteristics which would point to one or other heading, uh, would be classified as a scarf, as a textile item under scarves. And the plastic toys would be, but, but there, there was a whole cache of um, goods before the first tier tribunal, which HMRC accepted were t t toys, or at least the first tier tribunal found they were they were toys. So if, if the goods um, have nonetheless got the characteristics of toys, then they are in ninety five oh three anyway, because they will be other toys in their own right, wooden, plastic, whatever, in their own right. So for example, the question of the the, the hearts, I think the dispute on hearts was that HMRC said, uh, I said that they're not toys, they're not obviously toys, mm -hmm. so that's why they fall outside 9503. But if you've got a toy mobile phone or a, toy or a wand or a, something like that that you use with, but is not obviously a, a toy implement of itself, there, the first tier tribunal said, well, they are, they are toys and they're exempt. Um, so might the scarf, the miniature, miniature scarf, yes. which is inevitably a toy, uh, fall into other? I can't remember now whether we said the textiles were toys or whether we said they were articles of textiles. It may be we said they were articles of textiles. But, okay. Um, but I mean, I'm reluctant on the hoof to, to commit to that because I can't remember because those, do those 
products are not no, under no, I've appeal. Taken you, I've taken you away. And, uh, and I don't want to say anything that's incorrect. Mr. Thomas, can I um, just go back to the... I, I hope not taking you into the, the, the detail of, of particular items, but is it, is it right, on your case, to say that you have this Note 3 and GIR1 says that you apply it at the heading level, there's no yeah. reason not to, and you apply it once and once only, and that gives you your answer. So is, is that where you're headed on? The yes. It's sort a of simple outcome. It's, just, yes. it's, it's a one-time thing. You yes. ask yourself, you've got all the, the things in the heading, and you go through and you say, um, is it principally, whatever the wording is, yes. it, or suitable yeah. principally for, for this, as an accessory with this? And once you've got your answer, you say that's that. Yes. You don't, you don't go down into... Correct, yeah. because that tells you where the thing is classified, because okay. it's classified with the thing that it's suitable for use with. Mm -hmm. So it's a once-only thing, and it's a yes-no question. If it is solely or principally used with X, it's classified with X. And if so then not, we struggle a bit to see why not. dolls has got parts and accessories put separately, because that sounds a bit confounding. But one reason would be where it's not a sole or principal. I don't know. what. Yes, we, uh, we did find some uses for that. Raised. Yeah, if the upper tribunal is right, then that 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 um, that phraseology encompasses not only sole and principal dolls accessories, but also equal use dolls equal accessories principle. and potentially a third category. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. If I am right on and, and and we say that that is correct and we win for that reason, but uh, an alternative view, which will also leads to me succeeding, is that um, all parts and accessories which fall within 9503 have to pass the Note 3 test in relation to a particular goods in the heading. And if they don't, they fall outside unless they are toys in their own right. And on, that, so view, just, sorry, go on. on, on that view, parts and accessories is an unnecessary, uh, it's unnecessary. And that's what the upper tribunal, they, they, they took the view that that was an unattractive submission because it sort of meant that there was that, that that you had to ignore parts and accessories there, and I and I disagree with that. I say it's not really ignoring it; it's just saying that it's there for whatever reason. But the court doesn't go around assessing or interpreting the nomenclature by reference to the reason why things are included in some heading or or another. There's no underlying policy to this, like there would be a domestic statute. There's no context or no overall aim that you're saying. Well, this is a piece of planning legislation, so. It's, we, we've got to look at the environmental objectives, or there's nothing like that in a, in a nomenclature which is interpreted by reference only to those limited principles in the GIRs, and that's why I say those sorts of redundant construction arguments don't have the bite or the appeal that they might otherwise have. Can I just explore something you, you were saying a moment ago? Yeah. So you say you apply note three. The, the main heading. Yeah. Um, uh, by which you mean, as I understand it, you don't apply it in relation to the composite, you apply it in relation to individual items. Yes. Now, suppose that's wrong and you do apply it in relation to the yes. composite. Um, then you are applying note three in relation to subsidies. Okay. Yes, correct. As the upper tribunal did. As the upper tribunal yeah. did. Um, but that you would say on one of your cases is also fine. You, yeah. you, you still treat note three as yep. determinative, yep. even though you're at the subheading stage rather yes. than the top heading stage. Yep. On, on my respondent's notice case, the dolls heading never comes into operation because these things are not suitable for you solely or principally with dolls. Yeah. On the upper tribunal's approach, which is my what I'm here principally to defend, the dolls heading does it do, does apply, but note three has to apply at the subheading stage, just as it applies at the heading stage, and it answers the question at that stage by decisively by placing these goods with the animals, the stuffed toys, not animals. Um, the so that your lord, my, my lord, is absolutely right in in that in that analysis, and. The only difference really is that I apply note three to exclude these objects from the dolls heading at the heading level, whereas the upper tribunal accepted that they would fall within the heading, but threw them out at the subheading level. Mm. 
Um, now, and if if I then try to relate that to the general rules, yes. Um, as regards three A at least, yeah. I, I assume you say, well, look, one tells you that you apply the chapter note, and provided such headings or notes don't otherwise provide require, require you go on to deal with three A. Yeah. And do you say, well, the chapter note does otherwise require exactly. And so you never get to three A, and you never get to six either. I think. Well, you get to six. So you get to six because of the to, to determine which subheading. Um, so six applies one to five mutatis mutandis to, to yes, the subheading. That's what you mean. Yes. Um, but but the same answer follows. But, yes. And, and and your lordship is your lordship is right. Um, the same answer follows. Um, but but if. But if the respondent's notice point is right, as my lady Justice, Justice Whipple says, the, the the whole process is short circuited by the fact that you just know where they're going to be anyway. There's only there's an any any going to be one article within within 9503 where it's going to be. So, although you probably should um, theoretically um, go through the exercise of looking at each subheading, there's only going to be one that's going to be applicable because of the result of your note three test that you've applied to the goods because you're going to think these are only usable for tri tricycles so they've got to go with tricycles and there's no other place for them to go. These are principally use usable with tricycles. Totally or principally yes, yes exactly yeah. yeah and that that's enough to just make tricycles the relevant that's port it. of call. Yeah. yeah. So I say that there is a logical ease of verification uh, type argument there and that's what the tribunal the first year tribunal accepted that submission at 177 and I say that um, I say that they were right. Now, um, I should um, deal um, with the new point which is um, raised about the incompatibility um, of note three with the, the terminology of the DOS subheading. Um, we say in our skeleton that no permission um, exists for this, and I, and I, do, I do continue to maintain that submission. Um, the arguments for which permission was granted were contained in three paragraphs of that permission skeleton, which I've drawn your attention to. And there is no reference to this GIR 6 argument in any of it. And no, position, no permission was um, sought at that stage um, for it. And no explanation has been proffered then or since for why it is that this argument having been raised first in pleadings before the first tier tribunal and dropped um, before the first tier tribunal not determined was never raised before the upper tribunal and never raised in the permission application before this court. Um, I just draw your attention there to um, Ample Ward, uh, a recent case in this court. Um, Tab uh, 40, tab 45, ample award, and paragraph 47, page invite you to read 47. So I would invite the court to refuse um, permission to rely on this extra argument. Um, there's no explanation for why this point was not argued before the first tier. No explanation for why it was not advanced or argued in the upper tier. And no explanation for why it was not included in the permission skeleton. And 
I submit that is not how the appellate system, particularly at the third time of asking, is supposed to work. I mean, one feature of AMPLA Board is you see in the last sentence, paragraph 47, that it wasn't clear that there would be no prejudice. Yes, well, what I say to that is that what we mean in paragraph 45 in our skeleton, where we say it's a mixed question of fact and law, is that quite a lot of what the appellant says about incompatibility between GIR 6 and the, note, the dolls subheading depends heavily on assertions about the applicability of the doll subheading, namely that they are um, accessories of dolls. But because this point wasn't argued in the way that my learned friend now argues it, the first tier's conclusions are all couched by reference to the argument being about principal or sole use. They're not couched by reference to whether these are dolls' accessories. But doesn't that, in practice, also turn on a question of law? I mean, if you're right that it has to be the main use, yeah. then they're not dolls' accessories. Yeah. But if, on the other hand, uh, as a matter of law, equal use yeah. will do, then they are dolls' accessories. It doesn't seem to require any further factual investigation. Well, um, if I'm right about if I'm right about the um, the main use, then that um, falls away. But then you still you still have the first tier's findings being couched by reference to the arguments deployed before it, and not specifically considering this question. And that's why the furthest the FTT goes is paragraph one seven seven, where she says, "Well, I don't even think these are dolls' accessories because they're." they're not mainly used with dolls. Um, so by not deploying it properly in, in front of the first tier, both the first tier hasn't made proper findings about it. The upper tier could only say what they said at 120 and 124. And that's just not how the, that's not how the appellate process is meant to work, even in the context of pure points of law. Um, but I accept you have a discretion to allow this, but those points, um, are certainly, certainly worthy of consideration and in the absence of a proper explanation for it, um, I suggest would merit a refusal, but I'm going to deal with the argument on the substance, which, um, and I've already um, identified um, in broad terms what I want to say about it, namely that there is no frank incompatibility between simply giving note three its designed effect notwithstanding the presence of those words in the, um, in the doll's subheading. And um, I, I, I submit that my, my learned friend hasn't actually identified any incompatibility between the two. Can I, can I just, um, the, the reference to incompatibility comes from the HSENs. So you'll see that at page 845 uh, of the authorities point. So, uh, 845, uh, tab 46. Um, the HSEN gives an example there of such an incompatibility. The example given is in relation to chapter 71 where there are two contrasting definitions of platinum, one in chapter note 4b and that in subheading note 2. So there's a subheading note which contains a different definition from a chapter note. And so when interpreting the subheading, you don't also apply the chapter note because obviously the two definitions are in contrast. Now, that's obviously not an exhaustive description of the, of the sorts of examples of incompatibility that you can get. But it is a graphic demonstration of a frank definitional conflict between, on the one hand, plat platinum meaning X, and on the other hand, platinum meaning Y. And which, which do you apply? And that 
um, that conflict is itself referred to in the, the, the subheading notes. If you look at the authorities bundle, page 31. So tab three, page 31. subheading notes themselves draw attention to the conflict and resolve it. So not with the note 2 at the bottom of page 31 says notwithstanding the provisions of chapter note 4b for the purposes of the subheadings in question the expression platinum does not include all those things. And similarly there's another example on page 9 top of the page, subheading note 2, which says note 3 to chapter 29 does not apply to the subheadings of this chapter. So again, the subheading notes themselves draw attention to it. Note 3 itself, if you look back at note 3, it's only ever expressed with relation to headings anyway. Um, if you, that's page 7. Foot of the page. Goods which could be included in two or more headings of this chapter are to be classified in that one of those headings which occurs last in numerical order. So that's, a, I would suggest, a subheading note more for the avoidance of damp than anything else. But anyway, a potential conflict resolved by that. You, you do not find any such... Uh, provision in 9503. There's nothing to qualify the application of chapter note 3 um, at all, save for the opening words which say subject to note 1 above. So if I just ask you again uh, to look at page 56, where you'll find chapter note 3. It is only made subject to note one, which are a series of exclusions, um, which none, none of which apply to the, um, the circumstances of this case. And there are no subheading notes at all. Um, so nothing to indicate or say why there is any um, conflict. And can, can I next turn to the question of um, ice skates briefly because my submission in relation to that is really that there's, there's no real analogy to be drawn um, between um, the propositions on ice skates and here because the page that my own friend is referring to is at page 59 where there is a subheading which covers ice skates and roller skates, including skate and boots and skates attached, and then sub-subheadings for ice skates, roller skates, and parts and accessories. So HMRC accept, as we do in our supplementary skeleton, that where there is a dedicated subheading for parts and accessories, parts and accessories which fall within that subheading are classified there. So parts which are suitable for use principally or solely with ice skates would be classified in the parts and accessories subheading. But they would still be classified in that subheading. In other words, in the same subheading as the primary goods with which they are used. They're not classified in some other subheading which relates to goods with which they are not solely or principally used.
but it's difficult to see how that illustration provides any support for the sort of conflict which um, my learned friend uh, I I identifies. Can I just I think while it's in my mind, yeah. take you back to another point. Suppose there it says ice skates, semicolon, roller skates. And you had had an item that was equally applicable for ice skates and roller skates. Yes. And it would fall out of this entirely, on your case? On the respondent's notice point, yes. Because so they depends wouldn't... on how you frame the, the heading. If, it, if, if you put in a semicolon, you change the consequence. No. No, um, I, I think, I think um, as I indicated earlier, my submission is that in order to fall within the scope of 9503, it needs, the goods need to be solely or principally uh, used with identified goods within the heading and subheadings. If they're not solely or principally used with goods of one particular type, which is identified in the subheading, then they fall outside. And that arises irrespective of whether um, the types of goods are separated by an and or a semicolon. So can I take you to your top heading, 9506? Yes. 9506, yes. On the previous page, you end up with swimming pools and paddling pools. Yes. So now we suppose an item which is equally useful for a swimming pool and a paddling pool. I'm not quite sure what that item could be, but yes. let's assume there is such an item. Uh, yes, I will. Um, if it's principally of use for the composite swimming pools and paddling pools, is it within the heading? Uh, I say no. It has to be su principally suitable for use with either a swimming pool or a paddling pool or a gymnastics piece of equipment, or an athletic piece of equipment, or table tennis, or whatever. And if, when it says articles and equipment for general physical exercise, gymnastics, well, let's say items and equipment for general physical exercise, it's broken that down into items and equipment for, um, I don't know what, suppose different categories, then that would mean that things fell out when otherwise they would have, it, it all turns on how you framed your heading. Um, it all turns on, it all turns on the goods with which they are principally used. That's, that's the link. So what I say chapter note three is predica predicated upon is some genus of primary goods with which the things are used. So that depends on how you frame your genus. It, you it do does. it more or less specifically. It does, and the way you frame them is by reference to the classification of that primary, that those primary goods. So, in the example of ninety five oh six, it would be goods named in the subheadings of that um, of that heading. So, skis, water skis, surfboards, golf clubs. Table just tennis equipment. Tested to tell you a bit more. Take 9506 9, again. Yep. It says articles and equipment for general physical exercise, gymnastics, athletics, other sports. Um, yes. Suppose it had enumerated some. Yes. Um, football, hockey, rugby. Yeah. Or other sports. Mm -hmm. And you found something that was of use for football and rugby. What happens then? You ask yourself whether it's solely or principally for use for either. And if one or the other, then it's classified with those. And if not, then it's not. So for example, tabards, uh, which one might wear um, uh, when practicing. For yeah, example, for hockey or basketball. For hockey, for hockey yeah. or football or basketball yeah. or whatever. They wouldn't if be... they were set out as uh, items, as my Lord Lord Justice Nunez yes. suggested, uh, would fall outside. Yes, they would be classified as tabards. Because they wouldn't be, yeah, they'd be tabards. They'd be tabards, rather so than access, sports accessories, yes. Whereas here they're in because they're to do with other sports. 
Uh, no, because they wouldn't be they wouldn't be in because I say that the way that the respond the, the, the way that the respondents yes. notice meaning of node three works, and the way the first tier interpreted node three is to say that the the predicate is that you know where the principal goods are classified. So you know that um, stuffed toys are classified in a particular subheading of the nomenclature. Once you know that, you can classify the parts and accessories with those goods. But finding the right subheading for the goods, the, the principal goods, is, is, a, is a precondition for doing the Note 3 job. So you don't start at the top and say, is this principally for use in relation to something listed at the top? You start at the bottom well, and ask whether it's principally No, no, no. You, 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 st you start by looking at what's included in the heading, but you start by reference to a factual premise, which is that the goods with which your accessories are used are classified in that heading. Now, in order to know that your goods are classified in that heading, in order to classify the accessories with them, you need to know what those goods are and where they're classified. So that means that you're, you're not using, you're not reversing the hierarchy in terms of classifying your accessories, but you're classifying your accessories by reference to a known quantity namely the correct classification of the goods with which they are used. So you've got to have some idea what those goods are. Principally used. Principally used, yes. Principally used. So you've got to have some idea of what those goods are and where they're classified in order for the Note 3 job to be done. So it's not good enough to say, well, they're principally used for other sports. Well, I say it's not good enough. I say yes. On the respondent's notice point, yes. On the upper tribunal's approach, it is good enough. No, I follow on the upper tribunal's yeah. approach, but just yeah. understanding the response. Yes, status. yeah, no, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I need to, um, I need to take you to a couple of couple of things on on that. Um, I was. I'm, I'm, I may as well just go straight on to the respondents' notice on, 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 on those points, just, just, just while we're, we're on it. But before, before we get there, I mustn't forget just to address the remainder of this Rule 6 argument, where, where I, I, I just, my, my bottom line submission on this um, incompatibility point has got nothing to do with my respondents' notice construction. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm doing in answering the GIR 6 point is defending the upper tribunal's approach, which is to say that even if these goods are within the heading, they do not fall within the doll's subheading because Note 3 takes them out and classifies them with the, the stuffed toys. And that is a perfectly permissible approach because that doing that does not involve any incompatibility with And in truth, what I say the appellant's case amounts to is replacing note three with a different test of suitability for use. So that's um, the point that we make at paragraph 66 of our skeleton, uh, which you'll find um, on page uh, 117. of the core bundle. So quite apart from anything I want to say about the respondent's notice, I say um, uh, or we say tail end of 66 dealing with disapplication of note 3. The only conceivable grounds for including these goods in the doll's subhead is that they are suitable for use with dolls. But that is to replace entirely the test for something whether it's classified as a part and accessory of other goods as set out in Note 3 with an entirely different test based on mere suitability for use. 
So in other words, what my learned friend has identified is not an incompatibility, but a test which he doesn't meet and which he would prefer to be a use-based test. That's precisely what he does, because he says once you hit parts and accessories onto the doll subhead, you don't need to worry about principal use or sole use exactly. or any of those things. It's just a connection. Yeah. It's some sort of use. Exactly. Some sub principal yeah. use. A minority use is good enough, as long as it's not fanciful or theoretical. Yes. And there is no textual basis for treating that circumstance as in any way conflicting with the application of Note 3, which is there des specifically designed to identify a close use relationship as a governing one. The, the whole point of Note 3 is to replace ordinary use, which might you might end up anywhere with ordinary use as your criterion. Note 3 is there to draw a tight relationship between sole and principal use, so where that tight relationship exists, and gives that a classification consequence, namely classification following. So it's, it's not only there's no textual support for it, it's, it's the opposite. Um, now, I, I see the problems with the, um, the um, respondent's notice construction of um, note three being that where you've got goods where, which can be equally used for two items in the heading, they seem to be accessories of that heading. But yet, I say they fall out. That's the, un that's, the, that's the point with which you are wrestling, and I have to answer. And I've tried to answer that by reference to the simplicity of the test, and what I say is the sort of factual predicate, namely a particular good classified somewhere with which you can establish or not that relationship. That may succeed, that may not. But I want to just show you um, the HSENs to 9503 and one case. So um, the HSEN's first to um, 9503, um, that is um, 852A of the bundle, which is behind tab 47. So these are harmonized system explanatory notes. They're not legally binding, but they are useful aids to interpretation. <clears throat> and um, there are a number of references to parts and accessories here. Um, if we just look first of all at 850, You'll see dolls, a list of things there which are um, included as examples of dolls' accessories, all of which I suggest would pass any principal or sole use test. Um, but importantly, 852A, 852A is a general explanatory note about the heading with which we are concerned, and it's entitled Parts and Accessories. And what it says is, this heading also covers identifiable parts and accessories of the articles of this heading, which are suitable for use solely or principally therewith, provided they are not articles excluded by Note 1. And I suggest that supports my Note 1, oh, sorry, my Chapter Note 3 construction, because it suggests that any article classified as an accessory has to have that relationship with specific articles of that uh, heading. And one case to refer you to, a um, case of import gadgets. That is a tab 10 of bundle 1. This was a case about um, 
laughing devices for dolls. See that from the paragraph two on the right hand side, right hand column. Laughing devices for dolls were classified as um, accessories of dolls. I'm sorry, which um, I've lost the tab number. Sorry, tab 10, Thank you very much. page 74. And the issue was whether they were dolls, parts of dolls, or sorry, um, accessories of dolls or um, of other toys. You'll see that from page 75. Left hand column, the first consignment was treat, or declared for customs purposes as part of an accessory of dolls. The second one was declared as toys, and there was some sort of import quota and restriction in place which made that significant. Page 76, left hand column, foot of the page. Um, the commission submission was that the chapter note, which was then chapter note four of chapter 97, but in identical terms, should be applied to the subheading. It said, note number four of chapter 97 concerning subheading 9702, uh, of heading 9702 dolls, which reads, parts and accessories which are suitable for use principally with, etc., etc. So the there was a specific reference to parts and accessories in the dolls subheading, but the court had no difficulty accepting that submission, that the chapter note should be read, or the parts and accessories phrase should be read subject to it. Uh, you'll see that in paragraph eight on page 78. They say, well, it's listed in the parts and accessories examples for dolls. It's not listed in the parts and accessories example for toys. Then this. This justifies the conclusion that voice and other Sorry, mechanisms. Sorry, I lost you. Where are we? Sorry, top of page 79. Yes, that's it. So having decided that laughing devices were included in the list of examples for dolls' accessories, they're not included in the list of examples for toys' accessories. Conclusion to be drawn from that. This justifies the conclusion that voice and other mechanisms are suitable for use, if not solely, at least principally, in dolls, which are representations of human beings, notwithstanding that they may be suitable for other uses. So two, two points to get from that. First of all, that the terms of the HSEN are to be construed as if they applied the Note 3 test. In this case, it was the Note Note 4 test, to the identical terms. And second, that the court had no difficulty in importing the sole or principal use restriction into a specific reference in the tariff to parts and accessories of dolls. The tariff in 1972 was different because, as I've said, there was a heading for dolls and a subheading for dolls and parts and accessories. But, um, and we, we've given you that, that the tariff, um, we've given you that at tab six. Um, but the point is that, notwithstanding a specific reference to parts and accessories, the court was pre prepared to condition that by reference to the sole or principal use test. So there's nothing heretical about it. And so the only other parts, so um, just looking at the upper tribunal's um, decision which on the respondent's notice point, we, we take issue with, but uh, as, a, as an entire alternative, as I've explained. Can I just ask you to look at page 248 of the core bundle? There are essentially um, three paragraphs 
which where the upper tribunal's reasoning against my construction of the note three tests application are set out. They are paragraph 105, 108, and 109. So 105 is the redundant construction point, which I've addressed, and I don't need to address you any further. But I, I say they go too far when I say when they say it requires you to ignore the wording of the dolls hut subheading. That's not not what I say. 108 is where the first tier say, well, even without note three, we say that the accessories can come within the subheading by reference to the HSENs. Um, now, that, that, that's not right for a number of reasons. First, as I've already shown you, import gadgets shows that the explanatory notes assume the application of note three rather than demonstrate any independent basis for inclusion within the heading. And that is something which the appellant used to agree with and may, maybe still does. Uh, and I just invite you to look at paragraph 45 um, of the permission skeleton um, at page 33. So you say that the, the upper tribunal gets its law wrong here because it's relying on the HSCNs to read yes. something into the heading. And yes, can't do whereas, that. whereas the, 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 the HSCNs can't be used to alter the meaning of the heading. They are there simply to explain what's in there. So they certainly don't show that those things are in there without recourse to note three. That's not their job. And import gadgets shows the opposite, namely that the appearance of something in the HSENs was taken in that case by the court to be an indication that the note three test was met. But here the upper tribunal is using the HSENs for the opposite reason. They say even without note three, the HSENs can allow us to classify all these things as accessories. And I say that that's wrong um, because the HSENs are uh, of a different order of relevance. They are aids to interpretation and as I say, the appellant um, uh, used to agree with that. Um, paragraph 45 of its skeleton, page 32 of the core bundle, which I, I won't read out, but I, I simply ask you to note. So, um, and at 109, the upper tribunal is there. Um, discussing the points that, that, your, that your Lordship and, and, and my Ladyship have, have asked me about in the course of today, namely what happens to something that's equally suitable for use with both. So really, um, it comes down to this redundant construction point that, that my submission treats um, dolls and accessories, parts and accessories thereof, as an unnecessary piece of text uh, when compared with the coherence and simplicity that I say my meaning of note 3 has that unnecessary piece of text is a small price to pay uh, and, um, I, and I say that that sort of approach to construction is not one which you see deployed in the case law um, to any extent so that I think takes me uh, on to um, 3A. I don't really want to say anything about 3A other than what we say in our skeleton at paragraph 69. Um, there's a respondent's notice point on 3A, but which I will deal with briefly. But page 118, please, of our of the core bundle. Um, can I just invite you to read paragraph 69? That's our answer to no, uh, to, to 3A. Uh, 
And the reason I say that that's right is that, for reasons which I've already developed orally, the whole point of Note 3 is to obviate any need to rely on Rule 3, Rule 3, uh, to determine classification. Now, there is a point um, on the respondent's notice, which is that if the appellant is wrong um, about disapplying uh, note three at the GIR for the GIR six reason, um, they say move on to GIR 3 because note 3 shouldn't be given its dispositive role. If I am wrong that it should be given its dispositive role, and you say it shouldn't be, then we're in note 3 territory because you've got two applicable subheadings, dolls and accessories thereof, and uh, toys representing animals uh, or non-human creatures. There, 3A says you, you, um, you adopt the more specific one. And before the first tier, um, HMRC's case was, well, you have to read the toys representing animals heading with the chapter notes, because that's what rule one tells you to do. You don't read the headings in isolation. They're to be read with um, the chapter notes. And if they are read with the chapter notes, then both are equally specific because they both capture one potential use of the goods. Dolls accessories as dolls accessories and toys accessories <coughs> as toys accessories. Now, we, we set out our submissions on this at 81 to 86 of the skeleton. And the case that is relied upon against me is Hasbro, where this court decided that when looking at 3A, you don't take into account the HSENs in evaluating the specificity of competing head headings. And the principle that the court identified is that you don't look at the HSCNs to see what's included as part of a textual analysis of what's written as the heading. The distinction in this case is that we are not looking at an HSEN, but with a legally binding chapter note. And you are required to read the headings alongside the chapter notes. So they're not aids to construction. And they're not lists of things that are included, like the HSENs can be. So on that footing, I say the first tier tribunal was right. Um, and its conclusion is set out in at one at page two zero six. <clears throat> Two zero six, paragraph one hundred ninety nine. It's right at the bottom of the page, where the judge says, "I say neither of the dolls or toys heading provides a more specific description." And then, could I just invite you to read the two reasons that the judge gives, one and two? So if you read the, the headings in the context of the chapter notes, what she says there, what the judge says there at subparagraph two is right. Uh, I cannot see how one of these descriptions can be said to be more specifically describe or completely identify the clothing items than the other. 
Each identifies the clothing items as accessories, but for use with different articles, namely dolls or toys. And um, she thereafter rejected the submissions which my learned friend began to deploy this morning about bigger, smaller classes or large and variety of goods within different um, headings uh, in, the, in the subsequent paragraphs. Um, can I briefly then touch on shoes? Uh, because Lord Justice Nugie's decision on permission indicated that unless there was a discrete point of law in this, um, that permission should be refused. My submission is that there is no discrete point of law identified in the submissions. And uh, to make good that uh, point, uh, I would like to take you please to page 87 of the core bundle. to the two uh, key paragraphs where the challenges are set out. Paragraph 80. The shoes fit some human dolls and some animal toys. There is no basis to distinguish between the two uses. Um, that, that is frankly challenging the tribunal's conclusion of fact to the contrary that there was a basis to distinguish between the two uses. The first tier set out the facts that the first tier relied upon to do that. And that conclusion can't properly be challenged on uh, appeal to this court. In particular, because that very same challenge was rejected by the upper tribunal. Uh, I'll take you to that um, in a minute. The next challenge is, is at 84, and you can see that it's really the same point. Halfway through the paragraph, on this basis, it is, it is submitted that there was no way to distinguish between suitability for use with human dolls and suitability for use with stuffed bears. Well, the tribunal did do that. Uh, and it's what is said there is that the tribunal's um, statement did not flow from any conceivable logic. Well, the upper tribunal disagreed with that. And effectively treated this as an Edwards and Bairstow point, which it is. And um, the relevant conclusion is at, um, sorry, it's page 255. The case that um, Mr. Sykes deploys before you uh, was deployed before the upper tribunal at paragraph 136, and it's rejected at 137. I won't um, read out 137. But at subparagraph 4, having set out the findings of fact which the first tier made, they say the first tier was entitled to conclude that given the round shoes would only fit on dolls' feet where those feet did not represent human feet, they could not be principally for use with dolls. The first tier's decision that their design specification renders them suitable for use principally with stuffed bears did not represent a misapplication of the appropriate test. Correctly did directed it itself in law, and therefore um, did not arrive at a, a finding which no reasonable tribunal could properly have reached. Um, that is essentially what um, Mr. Sykes is asking you to revisit in the course of this appeal, and I would urge you instead to come to the same conclusion um, as um, Lord Justice Newey did, saying that if this is a challenge or an attempt to reopen the factual conclusion 
that the footwear was suitable primarily for toys, uh, then he says it's similar to point two, which I have refused. And so I invite you to refuse it for the same reasons. Um, finally, on this point, um, my learned friend um, said that it behoved the first tier tribunal to determine whether the access to footwear was principally suitable for all goods within the toys subheading. That was, I think, the point that he was trying to make. But that is not the Note 3 test. The Note 3 test requires the goods to be suitable principally or solely suitable for goods with which they are classified. The goods with which they are classified here are bears. A finding that they are solely or principally to be used with bears is enough. Just as I have never submitted that in order to fulfill the requirements of the doll subheading, a dress would have to be suitable for use with all dolls. That would be an absurd submission because dolls could be this big or this big. Uh, so you can't interpret the test as tightly as that by reference to everything that could conceivably fall within the heading or everything that could conceivably be a principal good. You just have to identify principal use with this thing. This thing is classified as a sub toy. That's enough. In my submission, that that disposes of um, that disposes of the of the of the point which was raised um, this morning. Um, just a couple of points um, which um, I wanted to reply on. Um, at various points in um, my own friend's submission, he talked about dolls with a tail and dolls without a tail, as if the phrase dolls in the heading should be read differently from the phrase dolls in the subheading. Um, there's no support for that. I do accept that it says dolls representing only human beings, but I say dolls means something representing only human beings anyway, and the HSENs are clear about that. And if you promise to buy a child a doll and you turn up with a stuffed bear, uh, the child would know the difference. So I don't, um, I don't accept that there is a different legal meaning between dolls in the heading and dolls in the subheading. They mean the same thing. And relatedly, my own friend was talking about what, why his, um, why his submission about the narrowness within of of the category of stuffed bear accessories or toy accessories could be justified. And he said, well, a kennel or a bone or a cage or whatever, that would be in. Everything else is out. And he said, well, bears don't wear clothes or shoes. That, of course, is true. Bears do not wear clothes or shoes. But these are not bears. These are stuffed toys. And toys, like stuffed bears, wear clothes all the time as we all know. So that attempt to parry the questions from the court, which were directed at saying, well, what ends up in the stuffed toys accessory heading on your reading is practically nothing, is, I suggest, unsuccessful, because it fails to comprehend the fact that these things are principally for use with stuffed toys. And yet, for some reason, I say contorted reason, they end up classified as dolls accessories. Um, my lord, my ladies, unless there are questions that I can assist any of you with, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Sykes. Yes, my lord. Uh,
like to focus to begin with on GIR 6, because that is actually the nub of this case. And it's convenient in response to my learned friend's points to, 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 to look at an actual example, the example that we saw of skates in the authorities bundle, uh, which is page 59 of the authorities bundle, tab 5. question for the court, and it's a yes or a no answer, is, is note 3, it's 9506-7010, is note 3 being disapplied at the 2-11? Uh, it's a yes or no answer. Um, and in my submission, the answer is, it clearly is being disapplied because the parts and accessories of ice skates are being classified not with ice skates where there's, where there's nil duty but with parts and accessories where there's 2.7% and my submission there's no other way to read this other than to acknowledge that GIR 6 is causing note 3 to be disapplied and the reason is that it enters into conflict with the wording of the provision. And you've heard how you, you, you're required to disregard this, disregard that. The combined nomenclature ignores redundancy because it suits HMRC in this case. Well, you're not permitted to do that. You have to apply the words. Now, note three does not require you to classify parts and accessories within the ice skates um, heading. Um, Clearly that's, that's wrong. Note 3 is disapplied because there is a competing subheading which specifically refers to parts and accessories. Now, that's an example and that shows Note 3 disapplying, Note 3 being disapplied by GIR 6. And then we come to the dolls and the toys heading and again We've got two on page 57. We have got two subheadings, dolls representing any human beings and parts and accessories thereof, and toys representing animals or non-human creatures. Again, these are two subheadings of the heading, tricycles, scooters, pedal cars, etc. And therefore GIR 6, again, is in point. And for the same reason as with ice skates, note three is disapplied. There's no conceptual difference between those two scenarios, and my learning friend hasn't been able to demonstrate that. Now, if that's the case, and parts and accessories is left to mean what it says, then I struggle to see on what basis the court is going to imply within those words some test that is different to the test set out by the court of, by the Supreme Court in Amina. It's simply plain meaning of the words. Now, it is true that we are only in chapter 95. We, we are only in these two subheadings potentially if we have got through via note 3 the 9503 nil heading it's, it's a nonsense that one can get there through the explanatory notes um, I thought that was being suggested sort of counter to my learned friend's main submissions early on but no one, no one considers that the upper tribunal was correct in that they made the same mistake as the upper tribunal in Hasbro one has to look at the wording and it has to be the heading as a whole and indeed bizarrely my learned friend took you to 852a which is the parts and accessories explanatory notes which says the heading also covers identifiable parts and accessories of the articles of this heading which are suitable for you solely or principally therewith but he didn't say what the heading covers and the implication was 
Because at least I understood it. It covers dolls, but it doesn't. It's 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 the whole heading, um, and we can see that at page eight fifty. That's what nine five oh three is. Tricycle top of uh, nine. 850, tricycles, scooters, pedicars, and similar wheel toys, dolls, carriages, not rubber toys. That is what 852A is referring to. And that is consistent with the view upheld by the upper tribunal that in order to get into the chapter, you apply note three to the heading as a whole. Quite aside from the nonsense that results if you don't, for example, parts being outside chapter which makes no sense. Now there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong in a result which causes accessories that are for human dollars on an ordinary test being taxed as such notwithstanding there is a discrete slit. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. That's what the words compel the court to find. And indeed, it makes a lot of sense that one is not making these minute distinctions between trousers which have got a slit that is discrete and trousers which don't, because a lot of toys are interchangeable. So for example, um, an accessory for a Star Wars figurine, it could be for Han Solo, who's a human, or it could be for um, Chewbacca, that's not, or it could be some other character in Star Wars that's not human because there is some uh, additional feature. And there are myriad examples uh, of such toys, Loki and Wolverine, the Incredible Hulk, uh, when he is and he's not um, uh, um, the Incredible Hulk, but just a normal human being. These kinds of distinctions don't matter. It's, is it a part or accessory for, for, for a human? In the ordinary, in the ordinary uh, sense, and yes, to have got into the chapter, one needs to have applied note three, but at the, at the, at the, at the level of the heading as a whole, and that result is less surprising, all the more so given the very, very um, specific nature of the note three test, which has been found to apply, where you have a slit, it makes no difference, or um, you have to be classified with. Uh, with all that, that takes you to, to animal to animal toys. Um, that that is a that is a very very um, illogical and counter counterintuitive result in my submission, particularly where the slip been found makes no difference. And that's a function of the Note Three test, as upheld by the Upper Tribunal. And as to the point, well, build a bear makes sells bears, well. In fact, they, they don't, they sell, and in the period in the UK, they sell um, dolls as well. That's irrelevant who's selling it. It's irrelevant who's importing it. Similarly, the logo, as um, found by the first year tribunal after discussion on these points, is similarly irrelevant. So if I can take you, please, to um, page 198 of the core bundle on that, where just, just, just to make... Has it been suggested that the logo is... Well, it was suggested, well, build a bear, that's what they do, they sell bears. Um, and I just want to reiterate the point that one is looking at the object itself, not the marketing material. And the logo, um, as was found um, 174 of the first year tribunal decision, simply indicates, I'll give your Lord and Ladyships a moment to read paragraph 174. irrelevant. One is looking at the object itself. Now, in terms of the cases cited, um, Amina, Epson, Proxon, GD European Land Systems, Vita, Vita, they were all about headings. They weren't about subheadings. 
So GIR6 never came into play. GIR6 was not relevant in any of these. Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Um, Do not run. I'm Do very, not use the lifts. I'm very sorry about Follow this. the instructions of fire evacuation officers. I'm very sorry about this, but I think we're going to have to reconvene having evacuated. I don't suppose there is a fire, but um, we'll rise. Return to the courtroom after. Sorry. We should return. Attention, please. Yes. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now.